Looking to protect your cards? Whether you need sleeves, deck boxes, binders, playmats, or even backpacks, Ultimate Guard has your collection covered. Literally. Premium products offering priceless protection. Visit ultimateguard.com. Hello and welcome to another Historic Brawl game video. Today we're taking a look at a green-white plus one plus one counter deck featuring R1 Mortal Queen as our commander, voted on by my supporters on Patreon. This 3-mana 2-2 legendary elf noble enters the battlefield with an indestructible counter on it, so as long as it has that counter it cannot be destroyed by opposing removal and it also cannot be taken out by damage, so it can block opposing creatures all day long and attack into opposing creatures without any trouble. Now it could still be exiled by opposing removal, opposing battle spells can also send it back to our hand, and it could also die to opposing effects that reduce its toughness to zero or less. Think of a Meat Hook Massacre, for instance. But otherwise, that indestructible counter is incredibly valuable. We can also pay one mana at any point, remove an indestructible counter from R1, and then another target creature gains indestructible until end of turn, and both R1 as well as the target creature will pick up a plus one plus one counter and a lifelink counter, so they will have a lifelink going forward. So that's where R1 can potentially trigger trigger some more plus one plus one counter synergies throughout the deck, and of course having that built-in protection is also quite valuable, means that we can potentially load a whole bunch of plus one counters onto R1 and have it be a relatively safe investment. So taking a look at our deck breakdown, we'll take a look at our creatures first, where we'll see quite a few plus one plus one counter synergies. At one mana we also get quite a bit of mana acceleration, with Elena Elves, Elvish Mystic, and the new Delighted Halfling joining Avacis Pilgrim, which we also got pretty recently. So four one mana accelerants is awesome, to potentially set up a turn 2 R1 or some other 3 drop. And then hopeful initiate can also keep growing as it attacks alongside a larger creature with training, can also cash in some plus one counters from our entire team to maybe destroy an artifact or enchantment. And then Asper Sentinel is also a great recipient of plus one counters as it can tax the opponent equal to its power. Then at 2 mana we've got Grateful Apparition, a 1-1 flyer that when it deals common damage to a player or planeswalker lets us proliferate. So by proliferating we can also get an extra indestructible counter on Arwen, so it can hand it out to a different creature while still staying indestructible, so we can keep protecting more and more creatures while growing them at the same time. So any way to proliferate Arwen's indestructible counter is also quite useful in this deck. Then we've got a Luminarch Aspirant giving us a plus one counter each turn. Canker Bloom can sacrifice to discern artifact or enchantment or to proliferate. There's a Gala Greeters which can also get a plus one counter when another creature enters or maybe help us ramp by making extra treasure tokens. Incubation Druid is also excellent if we can put a plus one counter on it because then it can tap for three mana instead of one, can also adapt it ourselves for five mana. Then Pollen Bride Druid can enter and put a plus one counter on target creatures, so that's one way to enable an Incubation Druid for instance, and then it can also proliferate instead, so it can also proliferate the indestructible counter on Arwen. We've got the Beast Caller which will pick up a plus one plus one counter whenever we cast another creature spell. Botanical Brawler can also keep growing as we place more plus one counters on our creatures and has two plus one counters to start out and trample. We've got Conclave Mentor as one of the many effects that will increase the number of plus one counters we get each time, so this one's also excellent, and when it dies we gain life equal to its power. And then Wildwood Scourge we can already play for x equals 1, it will enter with one plus one plus one counter in that case, and then whenever one or more plus one counters are put on another non-Hydra creature we control, we can put an additional one on the Scourge, and this also scales very nicely with any doubling effects like Conclave Mentor, and there's a few more enchantments and artifacts that we'll see in our non-creature slots. Then at 3 mana there's the Simeon Simulacrum, which can distribute 2 plus 1 counters when it enters, also has an Earth, so we can do it a second time from the graveyard. The Oran Reef Ooze is also excellent whenever it attacks, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter now on each creature we control, with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, used to be each attacking creature, so this is the slightly modified alchemy version. There's a Bloated Contaminator, 4-4 Trampler, that can proliferate whenever we damage an opposing player. It's also very good with R1. Evolution Sage will let us proliferate with a Landfall, so that's also the reason why we have one fetch land in our mana base, to potentially enable Landfall twice. Can also get out of hand. There's Kodama, to give modified creatures we control Trample. R1 is modified as it already enters with an indestructible counter, but also applies to creatures with plus one plus one counters on them. And then whenever one of those creatures can hit the opponent, we can search our library for a basic land and put it on the battlefield. 
There's Rishkar, which lets all our creatures with a plus one counter tap for green, and when it enters, it can also distribute two of those counters. Augur of Autumn lets us play lands and eventually creatures off the top of our deck, so nice card draw engine. Then there's Champion of Lampold, which will pick up an extra plus one plus one counter whenever another creature enters under our control, and then it will make our team unblockable for opposing creatures that are smaller than a Champion of Lampold. So if this is the largest creature in play, our whole team will be unblockable, which can also win us a game on the spot. And then a Knight of Autumn is quite flexible, can destroy an opposing artifact or enchantment when it enters, maybe gain for life against aggro, or we can put two plus one plus one counters on it, making it a 3-mana 4-3 that can maybe pick up some more synergies along the way. At 4 mana, there's Shalai, giving our other creatures hexproof, as well as protecting us from opposing discard spells or other burn spells. And then for 6 mana, I can put a plus 1 counter on the whole team. We've got Oracle of Moldaya to play lands of the top, lets us play an extra land as well. Can be a nice source of card advantage. And speaking of card advantage, if we can protect Captain Cisse with Arwen's indestructible ability, this can tap to search our library for a legendary card, reveal it, and put it into our hand. Not combining it with Paradox Engine here, but getting to search for a legendary creature or planeswalker, even a legendary land each turn can overwhelm the opponent in card advantage. And then a clay champion we can already cast at 4 mana, and if we cast it for double green, double white, it's essentially a 5 5 that can distribute two plus one plus one counters, also great synergy with effects like Conclave Mentor. And then at 5 mana, we've got the new Boonbringer Valkyrie, can back up onto one of our creatures, giving it Flying, First Strike, Lifelink, as well as a plus one plus one counter until end of turn, and then a 4 4 Flying, First Strike, and Lifelink itself. Defiler Vigor can also be excellent, letting us put plus one counters on the entire team whenever we cast a green permanent spell, and can also give those green permanent spells a discount by paying two life instead of green mana. Virgil's Gear Hulk, a 4 4 Trampler, enters distributing four plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures we control, can also load them all onto the same creature if we'd like. And at 6 mana, there's the Caretaker, a 4 4 with Hexproof, that can put two plus one plus one counters on another creature we control and can also transform into the Hunt Master, in which case we can put two plus one counters on the entire team instead. And Vorinclex Monstrous Raider is also excellent, doubling our plus one plus one counters while having the opponents, so it can also stop opposing Sagas in their tracks, as they cannot get any additional lore counters, very effective against opposing Planeswalkers as well. And if we can play our own Planeswalker, we can also double its loyalty, so we can maybe ultimate right away. And we've got some pretty exciting Planeswalkers to choose from as we move on to our non-creature spells, where we have some cheap removal as well, Source to Plowshares, a must-have in any white deck. There's Hardened Scales, another great ability, giving us extra plus one plus one counters every time. Thirsting Roots can also proliferate, or we can search for a basic. At two mana, Invasion of Gobakan can disrupt the opponent's hand, and if we transform it, it can add more plus one counters to the creatures that attacked, can also sacrifice it to give our team hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. The Fall of Gilgalad can also eventually put plus one counters on a creature and have it fight an opposing creature. There's also Lith, another Hardened Scales-like ability, but this can also pay 2 mana tap to put a plus one plus one counter on an artifact or creature we control, so that will immediately get doubled. There's Smell Fear, which has us proliferate, and then we get to fight one of our creatures with an opposing creature, so we can make it bigger first. There's Dromoka's Command, another one of my favorites in this deck. Can choose two modes between preventing all damage target instant or sorcery spell would deal this turn. Can be useful against burn spells and other red sweepers. We can say target player sacrifices an enchantment, gives us some more enchantment removal. But the modes we typically choose are to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, which can often get doubled by our various abilities. And then a target creature we control fights a target creature we don't control. So also gives us some instant speed removal and can be combined with that plus one counter as well. We were playing Arcane Signet at 2 mana as our only cheap ramp artifact. And then I'm also playing Astral Cornucopia, which I can play for x equals 1, costing me 3 total. And then it will enter with 1 charge counter on it. It can tap, choose a color, and then add 1 mana of that color for each charge counter on the Cornucopia. So if we can proliferate those charge counters, it can make even more mana. Staff of Completion is also an interesting one. Can tap it, pay 2 life to add 1 mana of any color, so another ramp artifact. But we can also tap it, pay 3 life to proliferate, or potentially draw a card. And then the life link from Arwen can also make up for it. There's Tribute to the World Tree, triple green, but then when a creature enters under our control, if it had power 3 or greater we get to draw, otherwise put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And then there's Fight Rigging, adding a plus 1 plus 1 counter to one of our creatures turn after turn, and then if we get a creature to 7 power we get to cast our Hideaway card for free. 
Cultivate helps us ramp, and then at 4 mana there's the Wandering Emperor can be used as removal or to add more plus 1 counters to the team. Guardian Project, another enchantment that can draw extra cards. A Jani is also excellent here, adding plus 1 counters to all our creatures, as well as a loyalty counter on each Planeswalker we control with a minus 2, as well as giving the team vigilance so they can play offense and defense, maybe still tap for mana after attacking. And then we're also playing the One Ring as a powerful card draw engine, and then we can make up for the life loss through Arwen's lifelink counter. At 5 mana there's Elspeth Conquers Death as a versatile saga that can remove an opposing non-land permanent with mana value 3 or greater, eventually gets back a creature or planeswalker from our graveyard with either an extra plus 1 counter or loyalty counter, so has more synergy there too. And sagas can also be proliferated, so we can potentially speed up the process. We've got Elspeth Resplendent, adding various ability counters as well as a plus 1 counter with a plus 1, so it can maybe help our creatures fly over the competition. And then Anissa doubles the mana produced by our forests, while adding plus 1 counters to our lands, turning those into creatures. And then at 6 mana we've got a few more Planeswalkers, the Eternal Wanderer has great synergy with Arwen, can potentially leave it in play alongside an opposing creature and sacrifice all the rest. And then if we've got a bunch of plus 1 counters on Arwen, it can take over the game, can also potentially flicker our own creatures or artifacts, or do the same with opposing creatures or artifacts. And then in the case of Arwen, maybe reset its indestructible counter that way, and then can also make two to Samurai Tokens with Double Strike. We've got Ajani Unyielding, which is great here in a deck that has very few instants and sorceries, because then the plus two is more likely to find a bunch of non-land permanents to put in hand, and can also exile opposing creatures with a minus two. We've got Plain White Celebration, which can potentially let us proliferate four times if that's what we want. Can also get back permanents from our graveyard, or make citizen tokens, or gain life. And then the Great Henge is another staple in green decks, especially when we have plus one counter synergy, can draw extra cards and gain life as well. And then our mana base has a few utility lands, like the channel lands Iganjo and Boseju. Castle Garenbrick can occasionally come in handy, maybe cast a Vorinclex or a Caretaker ahead of schedule, and a late game can also help with the commander tax. We've got lots of green-white dual lands, and then the Ruins can also potentially give us more plus one counters late game, and a Karn's Bastion, another way to proliferate. So those utility lands can be a nice mana sink if we don't have anything else going on. So yeah, that's our deck, now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the play, facing Kallax, a green-white enchantment deck. And our hand has a lot of potential if we can pick up a white source for Conclave Mentor, or just a third land for Cultivate. Yeah, we'll try it. Knight of Autumn can blow up one of their enchantments. Between Ozolith and Mentor we can make some monstrous creatures. So turn to Ozolith most likely. If I draw a play and I'll go with Mentor. And speaking of Ozolith... Okay, brush land counts. And then turn 3, likely to cultivate, to develop our mana. A Weaver of Harmony for the opponents. And I don't think I want to offer the trade, even though Weaver is pretty scary in its own right. Alex can put a counter on it. Take three. So with Knight of Autumn we have access to some removal. Probably want to get some counters going before we smell fear and proliferate. Also have the option of playing Arwen and keeping up mana to discourage any attacks. So no shortage of uh, options available. I think I should take out Calyx before it gets out of hand. And then I can play an Ozolith alongside it, and attack for two. Hope Weaver can copy a removal spell here, exiling both creatures. Parallel lives to double tokens instead. Okay. Fight rigging, quite nice with Mentor and Ozolith growing our threats. So, yeah, let's say we play fight rigging. Finding Nissa who shakes the world. And then activate Ozolith on night. Trigger fight rigging. And get a free Nissa. Attack for 10. And then still get to untap a forest. Scatter Grove is also quite nice with Nissa as a forest plains. But I want to. 
just small fear here. And get to proliferate again. Oh, that was quite a turn. And good enough for a concession. Next turn Kodama can trample our team after adding more counters to it. Sweet, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play facing a Raga Draga, so a ramp creature deck. Our hand has turn 1 Elvish Mystic, always exciting, and then a Jani to combo with Elspeth, adding loyalty to each other. So, seems like a decent start. Evolution Sage adding extra loyalty counters with Proliferate, also quite nice. Opponent also with turn 1 Mystic. Okay, let's show them a Plains, and then... Yeah, I think playing Evolution Sage here is alright, even though... I won't be proliferating next turn on a Jani, but then I can proliferate a turn after. What does Arwen do for me? It's just a blocker for the time being. Yeah, I think we'll just play Sage. Also have the option of playing Arwen next turn, playing a land and proliferating the indestructible counter. Ooh, Gwenna is quite scary. So, yeah, go for a Jani, adding counters, lots of attack. I think that's reasonable. Gonna be a Vizier of the Menagerie to play Creatures of the Top. And a Scrap Gorger. Okay. Well, let's think about our sequencing now. So we could play Elspeth. We get to proliferate with Sage, so that's still nice. And then we get an Elspeth down to maybe start flying some of our creatures. Or we could play Arwen as an indestructible creature that can also protect the rest of our team. Yeah, maybe we'll try that. Could also play Canker Bloom. Still add counters to it with a Jani. Or we can leave up Arwen's ability, which is also quite useful. So let's try that instead. And attack. Okay, so we now have two indestructible counters on Arwen. Can move those around. And then flying creature with Elspeth can maybe close out the game. Ooh, Nyxbloom Ancient. Yeah, that's a good one, especially when they get to untap Gwenna here. It's their opponents going off. Tripling the mana produced by their permanents. Circle of Dreams Druid off the top. And a Kami, so that was an impressive turn. Our opponent will untap with pretty much infinite mana. Could activate R1 here just to give a lifelink to one of my creatures, since it's going to be a lifelink counter. That may be okay. Untap. Picked up a Conclave Mentor. So let's figure out our sequencing. I imagine we want to get Elspeth down. Question is whether we play a land before or after playing Elspeth to proliferate. But uh, probably want to keep the Elvish Mystic as an untapped creature that can maybe attack with Vigilance. So, just figuring out if Conclave Mentor's any better. But I'm pretty sure we can get to 11 here. If we just go land, proliferate, Evolution Sage up to 8. Play Elspeth, giving Evolution Sage flying and one more counter, that's up to 9. Minusing a Jani, that's 10. And then we can activate Arwen one last time. To give it another plus one counter up to 11 power, which should be Xaxes. And can even attack with the rest of the team if we'd like. Awesome. So we found a way to take out the opponent before they could untap with all the mana in the world. Sweet, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing the five color shrines. Our hand's got a mentor, but no way to kind of kickstart the plus one counters to proliferate with apparition. And no early acceleration. So on the draw we probably need something a bit more explosive, as much as I like Gear Hulk with Mentor, this feels a bit slow. Okay, missing a 1-drop. If we can pick up a 1-mana creature, this hand's pretty great. Even a 2-drop with a Rishkar, I'll take. And then now we need an extra green source before we can play Tribute as well. Knight of Autumn's definitely good in the matchup. 
but no turn to play is a bit painful. Okay, so I could play Tribute, could play Knight of Autumn, although there's probably scarier enchantments we need to take out. So let's start with Tribute. Don't want to play Rishkar without a creature to put a counter onto. So a Life's Origin, find target for Knights, and then Galag Reaters is next. Not the most mana efficient turn if I just play Knight of Autumn, but I think it's the correct move. Opponent passes, 5 mana now, could play Oracle of Moldaya, play 2 lands, but I wouldn't be able to play Greeters necessarily. Could play Gala Greeters into Rishkar, that develops our mana the most. Yeah, that's not bad. Could also play Arwen to have something indestructible, that's maybe harder to kill with a board wipe, which is maybe what our opponent's setting up. Could also think about Guardian Project to at least get a bit more card advantage going. Yeah, let's just go Guardian Project and pass. Could attack with Knight, I suppose. This way we at least get to draw a few cards before our opponent wipes the board, potentially. Fruitful Harvests. Okay. So Knight can attack, unless we want to tap it with Rishkar. Let's start with maybe Gala Greeters. And draw with Project. And then play Oracle of Moldaya. Which can still maybe play Land of the Top. And draw a Halfling, make a treasure. Fight rigging on top. So let's start by attacking. If our opponent jumps, we know Sweeper's incoming and I'm not playing Halfling. Opponent takes it. So now maybe okay playing the Halfling. Get to draw a card with Project anyway. And uh, sure, let's gain two life. And then next turn we can play Arwen, Fight Rigging, can maybe get us to a 7-powered creature. Conquer's Death finally answers Guardian Project. Still 4 mana left for Cultivate. So our board is getting quite powerful. One ring on top, would love to draw that. So how do we make that happen? I guess I don't have any creatures large enough to draw with Tribute, unless, let's see, I guess with Rishkar we could make that happen if we stack the triggers correctly. So we first want to resolve the plus one counter and then the Tribute. And then we'll keep making treasure, I think. Counter on Rishkar himself, and one on, let's say, the Halfling. Draw the one ring, Sentinel on top. So play one ring, activates. Draw Sentinel. And a land of the top, and another one. Although Bosage would be nice to just have as removal. So maybe I just play the planes after all. Sentinel will tax the opponent quite a bit. And then I could still play R1 to protect some of my creatures, assuming there's no exile effect. As opposed to attacking with them, since their opponent's got a lot of life to work with. Alright, and yeah, I'm just gonna hang on to fight rigging for now. Hit for eight. And then a treasure activates R1. So now we're taxing the opponent for three. Next turn, Conqueror's Death will also tax us. So fight rigging is gonna be a bit more expensive, but we've got a lot of mana to work with. So does our opponent. And a Cleansing Nova to destroy all creatures. Does our opponent pay? They do. So activate Arwen, and which creature do we save? Probably Oracle.
and draw Boseju, Brawler on top. So we'll draw that with the One Ring. I'll land on top. And your opponent has seen enough, the One Ring is just gonna take over. Sweet, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw facing Zimon and Dina. Our hand is functional, but I wouldn't say exciting. We don't have a one mana elf. And when we have quite a few in the deck, it's worth taking a free Mulgan to look for one. All right, no elf, but I think a much better hand. We're missing the removal spell, but Conclave Mentor makes up for it. And then we could have a beautiful curve with our uh, Oran Reef Ooze, Arwen to protect the team, Clay Champion to boost them up. they will seem like they have a removal spell, unfortunately. Time for Zimon and Dina. It is. So they want to sacrifice creatures to put extra lands in play, basically. Well, let's play Ooze. And then... Yeah, tempted to just add counters to the Mentor. So it can attack right away, although I might be putting too many eggs in one basket. Ah, that's fine. Can still add counters to the Ooze later with Clay Champion or with Defiler, should they answer Mentor. I would love to keep hitting my land drops, especially with an Evolution Sage to proliferate. Got a couple answers to artifacts and enchantments. And a Spring Bloom a Druid is next, so good sacrifice fodder for Zimon and Dina, which can put extra lands in play. So yeah, they're ramping nicely, gonna leave the 3-4 back on defense. And then a pathway I probably want to play on white to have as much white mana as possible for Clay Champion, which I could already play here. And then I guess it's gonna be for double green, double white, but that seems good enough. The alternative is Arwen with the mana to add a counter to Ooze, but uh, this should work just as well. And smash. So that's an impressive turn four. But our opponent does get to chump. And we're definitely worried about sweepers here. So if we can play R1 to at least protect one creature, that would be great. Cultivator is fine, so keeps on ramping another body to throw in front of our huge creatures. If we can give the team Trample by top decking Kodama, that could also be very effective. Oracle of the Alpha putting the power 9 in their deck. Okay, so there's no artifacts or enchantments to take out. I could play Evolution Sage and then play a land, which would help us proliferate, can still play Canker Bloom afterwards. That seems pretty good, or I could play Arwen as insurance, which is maybe the safer move here. And then, not sure if it's worth it to play the land or keep it for Evolution Sage. But we'll start by attacking. Double chump. Triple chump even. Okay, that happens. So I am pretty afraid of a sweeper here next turn. A river's Rebuke comes to mind, would be quite effective and probably a reason to play out my land. Since we may need to rebuild. And then I'm not gonna play Canker Bloom, I'll leave up the one mana for Arwen. Emergent Ultimatum, okay. I'm assuming that's game over if our opponent's got the right cards to search up, but we'll see. Probably involves Omniscience, Liliana, and maybe a plain white celebration. Dreadhorde General could either ultimate or they can put an Omniscience in play. But possible they don't have all the combo pieces and are just playing it for value in a Sultai ramp deck. They may still be able to take an extra turn with either Epiphany or Time Warp. And the River's Rebuke might also be involved. So yeah, not loving my chances, but opponent's still thinking about it, so it's not obvious at least. 
and her opponent does have the Omniscience plus Liliana and then Vorinclex to ultimate Liliana right away. So I cannot give them either Liliana or Vorinclex. Vorinclex also stops my counter synergies. Um, but I think Liliana is still the scarier card. So we'll put that back. Opponent gets Omniscience and Vorinclex since we have to split up this combo. Otherwise they get to ultimate. So you get to have a Vorinclex, a 6-6. Six, six. Not bad on this board, but our creatures are still bigger. But the omniscience is what worries me. Opponent gets to cast all their spells for free. Final parting now as well. So our opponent's really going all in on the combo here with omniscience. An emergent ultimatum wouldn't be surprised if they had a bunch of tutor effects to search those up. So I'm assuming we're dead now, since they can just search up a Liliana, cast it for free. Ultimate, thanks to Vorinclank's doubling loyalty, and that should be game over. Opponents got us pretty good here with the Emergent Ultimatum, otherwise we're looking good. We were just missing, I guess, that one extra turn or trample to close out the game. So, Uro in the graveyard. And there's Liliana, and that should be game over. 12 loyalty, choose a permanent, they control of each type and sacrifice the rest. So I guess we'll uh, do this. Keep the Conclave Mentor. And then choose Creature. At least we get to keep Clay Champion as our artifact of choice, so that's nice. And then a land. So they cannot escape for free with Omniscience, but they still have three cards left. And a Binding can now destroy Clay Champion, since Mentor's indestructible. And they get to ramp right away, since they get to add an extra lore counter on the Binding. Cultivate now as well. Yeah, so as the dust settles, we do have a Conclave Mentor, which is bigger than Vorinclex, but that's about it. So, have to attack Liliana, force him to chump. But then our opponent should have it covered with Uro escaping from the graveyard. And Liliana drawing cards and making zombies. So yeah, the game was basically over. Canker Bloom is an eventual answer to omniscience, but the damage has been done. Liliana makes a zombie. Rise and shine. And there's Uro out of the graveyard. So yeah, in hindsight, giving them Liliana and Vorinclex would have been better than giving them the Omniscience, since they ended up casting both anyway. But of course we didn't know if they had a tutor effect in hand, and there's always a chance that their hand's a bit of a blank, and that uh, Omniscience doesn't do all that much. Terra Sunder deals with Mentor, and yeah, I think we can pretty safely scoop it up, even after a Time Twister with an Omniscience in play. That's rubbing salt in the wound here. Yeah, that's the card they got from Oracle of the Alpha. Our opponent's having fun, now Grim Shooter, as we suspected, to search up all the combo pieces. So didn't get to see as much of Zimon and Dina, but uh, yeah, Sultai Ramp with a combo finish instead. Time Warp takes an extra turn, the rest can take our Smell Fear. Opponent gets to empty their hand. Yeah, it's not gonna take long for them to deal lethal. Opponent gets to take a brand new turn. Zimon can sack Ranger, draws with Liliana. Uro's also a combo with Liliana if you just play it and put it in the graveyard since it's a creature dying, so it draws a card. Okay. As your opponent's almost done. Double thub draws. Visionary draws. <laughs> Zella draws. Yeah, that's the Avengers assembling here, one in each color. Uro and the zombie attack. And I'm just gonna take it. Could have conceded like 10 minutes ago, but kind of interesting to see the opponent go off. Roscoe makes an appearance. And still six cards in hand, restoration. Uh, 
the rejuvenator and gets the theater. Still a lot of untapped mana, so they could probably redraw a fresh hand with Midnight Clock, cast everything for free with Omniscience. And now Cruelty has another tutor. So they're gonna search up whatever card they want once again. Probably another extra turn card is my guess. Al runs Epiphany. Who knows what else? Maybe a Crater Hoof Behemoth. And put us out of our misery. Time walk. Alright, fair enough. That also works if you are playing Oracle of the Alpha. Now breach the multiverse. And get to return Vorinclex, perhaps. Although I guess that one may have gotten shuffled back. And then in our graveyard there's some goodies. Timeless Witness, get back an extra turn card. Or breach the multiverse. Our Rusko triggers. And there's Vorinclex again as well as Alrun's Epiphany. I guess there's always the chance their opponent mills themselves out if they keep a recasting Breach. But uh, yeah, Gear Hulk with Vorinclex in play. We also have that combo in our deck. Opponent stealing our Gear Hulk and now getting to double the counters. So it should be that here. Traverse has another tutor. Probably gonna die to Rusko triggers before we die to damage. Scholar has another way to get back those time warps from the graveyard. So opponent's got a few extra turns lined up if they want to, or they can cast Breach again. Nope, it's gonna be a time twister instead. Okay. At least we get to look at a lot of cards here. Cavalier for ramp. And a time warp. Midnight clock triggers. Someone in the comments can figure out how many cards our opponent's drawn this uh, match so far. Wall of Blossoms draws. Binding yet again with Vorinclex going to chapter 2. We're at 3 life. Now, how is our opponent going to kill us? Is it going to be an attack by Vorinclex? Is it going to be Rusko triggers? Place your bets in the comments. A Wayfinder mills us. And dig up tutors yet again. Opponents cast their fair share of tutor effects as well. Breach the multiverse, okay. Third time is the charm. And what do we get? Airtai Resurrected, we're at one. Liliana draws, killing her own Canker Bloom. And looks like they're gonna go with a Rusko trigger here. Children's Edict. Alright, GG's. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Thalia and the Gidrog. And good thing we've got plenty of basics here. Turn 1 Helenor Elves, turn 2 Greeters. Plus uh, Hardened Scales is looking nice. And then we want to try and get our Iganjo in play before the Gidrog monster makes it enter tapped. Assemble the team. The Alchemy Tutor effect here. Pretty good. Although at least in the early game it's less devastating because they can't search up a super expensive spell and cast it right away. But they might find some targeted hate card for our... Arwen, maybe some Edict effect or something that exiles. Okay, so play Iganjo and then next turn Farmland. And then for now, Greeters plus Scales looks good. And then Ajani plus Hardened Scales is also quite lovely. Setessen Champion's a good one. So there's some Enchantment Synergy. Guardian Project versus Ajani. Close call. If I play Project next turn, I can unload two creatures to draw. And Jani right now would add two plus one counter to our creatures. Although they might still be able to grow Champion and finish off a Jani, which would be a shame. So maybe I just play Arwen and pass with a mana up. And Greeters goes for either counter or treasure. Treasure lets me four drop plus two drop next turn. So as tempting as it is to uh, get a counter, I think I still make the treasure. And then if they remove Arwen by exiling it, 
I can still at least activate it on the way out and get some counters. Sterling Grove, another tutor effect, triggers champion. And I get to untap. Okay, so now I could also go with Guardian Project into a Delighted Halfling to draw a card and trigger Gala Greeters and keep up Arwen's ability. And then now I don't need treasure as much, so I'll go with plus one counter. Yeah, could consider attacking, but then I'm forced to maybe use Arwen. So I'll just pass. And then next turn, Ajani with a bigger board of creatures is going to be much more impressive. Canker Bloom can blow up Sterling Grove, but only want to go for it if they're tapped out and cannot sacrifice it in response. Thirsting Roots to search for land. Opponent's doing a lot of searching. Yet to see Thalia and the Gidrog. There it is. So, still have a basic to enter untapped. And the Indestructible is going to help us get past First Strike and Death Touch. Ooh, nice. Dromoka's Command. Also quite impactful. So our opponent still has a mana to sack Sterling Grove. Although Dromoka's Command can also make them sacrifice it potentially. I think I gotta start with a Jani. Add counters everywhere. Might have wanted to tap Halfling since it cannot make colored mana for Dromoka's Command, but that's okay. Can still use Arwen's ability with it. Minus. And then... What if I were to just attack all out? That seems reasonable with Dromoka's command available and Arwen's ability. Alright, opponent's gonna sack Sterling Grove. So that's happening. We'll get to see which enchantment they're looking for. A Meat Hook Massacre. Yeah, that makes sense. So our opponent will be able to massacre for X equals 5 potentially. So I can tap the Halfling to activate Arwen, which will grow Arwen and the Halfling up to 6 toughness. So they should be able to survive a Meat Hook Massacre for 5. And then I'll still have Dromoka's Command at instant speed to grow one of my creatures with at least 2 counters. And yeah, opponent uh, concedes here. Thalia and the Gidrock about to die, and we still have a massive board. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Adelis, so Blue Reds, Aggro, Wizards. And our hand is... Okay, not amazing. Also, Lith is definitely a good one. Can play R1 against Blue Red if it resolves. It's pretty difficult for them to remove. And then uh, we can proliferate the indestructible. I'll try it. Just having a big life linking R1 in this matchup is going to be quite useful. And then, uh, sure, we'll play planes. Turn one looting. And then I'm not sure yet if Roots is fetching a forest or if we're going to keep it for Proliferate. Play Ozolith. Next turn Arwen. Unless her opponent's keeping a blue mana, then I might take a different approach. And yeah, opponent keeps a blue mana. So Arwen somewhat likely to get countered here. So instead I can play Pollen Bright Druid and then just put a counter on itself. Which still applies a bit of pressure. Now that we drew a land, I'm more interested in... Uh, Keeping this to proliferate the indestructible. And then next turn I get to play R1 and keep up its ability at least. Opponent cast an opt. Cloudkin gets to draw a card. That's fine. So play R1. Hit for three. And then I may as well keep up the ability. As opposed to tap out for roots. See, get Stormcaller can copy their next spell. A bounce spell could be effective. And yep, Fading Hope. Bounce R1 and Polumbride Druid. That's annoying, so not much we can do about it. Indestructible is not going to help. Bounce those back to hands. And we got to rebuild. Not gonna swords, Cloud can see Alright, land is good. So now play R1 and then 
proliferate with Pollen Bright, perhaps. Although getting the counter might still be okay, and we can proliferate with Roots next turn. Might be slightly more effective. Could also put counter on Arwen itself. But if I put it on the Druid, so let's see. No, maybe putting counter on Arwen is still the way to go. Since we don't have an initial counter, can always activate Ozolith to put one on Druids to start going wide. The opponents already used their bounce spell, I'm hoping their author removal is mostly burn based, which doesn't get past indestructible unless there's a very specific burn spell that removes indestructible until end of turn. And then I might just want to make a large lifelinker. Alright, Exclusion Mage also bounces. So things aren't going our way. I will trade for Stormcaller just to deny critical mass of wizards, which is quite scary with Atlas. Chilling Trap, Shrinks Down Druid. Yeah, they're getting their value. Okay, so could just play Conqueror's Death, and that can eventually get back Pollen Bride Druid. Could play R1, activate Ozolith. Could play R1, play Elf, and then uh, still have a mana left. Which is also reasonable, although I would prefer to proliferate the indestructible before activating it. So, yeah, let's just activate Ozolith here. That should stop the ground creatures from attacking us. Play with fire is not gonna work. Indestructible does mean indestructible. So take two from the flyer. Opponents not willing to play Atlas just yet. So they've got something else up their sleeve. Okay, so if I don't want to tap out for Conqueror's Death, I can play Lanor Elves, activate Ozolith on it, and then Thirsting Roots to get the most value. Question is, if her opponent tries to burn the Elf, do I protect it? But her opponent doesn't. So let's proliferate. Alright, so now we've got an extra Indestructible to hand out. Arwen gets to attack. And Eternal Wanderer can also help with the plan of going all in on one creature. Wizardry, making two one ones, yeah. With prowess. So I'm probably gonna have to take out Atlas, first chance I get. We Dragonauts also setting up for a big turn here. And Cloudkin attacks. So it seems like they're setting up next turn to go Atlas, at least flashback looting, pump the entire team. So if one or else survives, I can just try an Eternal Wanderer next turn and leave them with a single creature. So let's try that. Eternal Wanderer. And then tap the Elf in the process. Is their last card a counterspell? Alright, looks like they didn't have any. Sweet, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Rizug, the Bona Cobbler. Which is a 1-3, says target creature card in your graveyard perpetually becomes an artifact and you can cast that card this turn. So they're gonna try and use creatures with powerful abilities to turn into artifacts, so even if they're not attacking and blocking they're still being useful. Our hand is missing maybe a 2 mana play since I probably don't want to play a fall on turn 2, but um, Hardened Scales is a powerful card, so I'm gonna give it a shot. And then ideally find a cheap creature with plus one counter synergy. That works. Turn to Aspirants, immediately picking up two counters. Might go with Contaminator, or we can play R1 first to try and protect Contaminator. Infernal Grasp immediately answers Aspirants. Yeah, probably safer to play R1 first. That way, next turn I could play Contaminator, keep up one mana. And unless they've got a Edict effect here, Arwen should survive. Black Market Connections is a good one. Could take it out with Poseju. Not sure if I'm interested. So, I've got a couple options. The uh, Staff of Completion, also quite powerful to help us proliferate. I think we get Contaminator down, and then we can protect it with Arwen. And then next turn we can start adding counters everywhere. 
Vessel Trumps. Possible our opponent setting up a sweeper here. But our opponent chooses all three modes. So controls a shapeshifter. We do have a fight spell lined up. And by proliferating we can speed up our saga as well. So the staff could help there. So if I draw land, I'm thinking maybe fall plus staff. Although if I tap out of staff, then I can't activate Arwen. But we have the flexibility of either keeping this up for one mana or to proliferate end of turn if our opponent taps out. Scatter Grove sadly enters tapped. So not quite what we needed. So in this case... Could go a Johnny, be tapped out, at counters, that seems risky. So instead, if I go for fall and attack and proliferate with the Contaminator, I can also level up my Saga. That's not bad. Yeah, I think we want to get the plus one counters going. And Captain Cissé is not bad. So let's keep that one on top. And attack. And then getting to proliferate the indestructible is also quite nice. And then a Johnny plus hardened skills is also living the dream. So it's possible our opponent forces us to use Arwen's counter before we get to proliferate it. Nope, we get to hit. And proliferate. So our opponent's already down to 13. And then the counters from fall. I could just put on R1 itself. Although Contaminator does have Trample, so it might be the more valuable target. Opponent still choosing all modes. So I'm intrigued to find out what their plan is here. They've got a lot of mana to work with, but the three twos aren't doing a whole lot right now. And then next turn we get to fight. So even if they have two removal spells, we can still beat those with two R1 activations. And yeah, our opponent just scoops it up. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Atraxa, Praetor's Voice, for color Proliferate. This hand would have been nice with an untapped green source for Anvison's Pilgrim, since we had the Explosiveness, the uh, Disruption from Invasion, and then Brawler plus Scourge can also deliver the beatdowns. So maybe I should just keep and hope to draw an untapped green source, since our hand's quite promising if we do. Yeah, you know what? I think this is a difficult enough matchup that I just need to get a bit lucky with my first draw step. There we go. So turn to what do we go for? Bone plays Heart of Kiron. And Hardened Scales is also quite nice. So I don't have two green sources to Hardened Scales plus one of my creatures. So maybe this turn I can Invasion of Gobakan plus Hardened Scales. See what they're working with. And then hope to find another untapped land. If not, I'll need to play this tapped Fabled Passage for a green source. Okay, we've got a Cornucopia, lots of Planeswalkers. So we don't care about Narset's passive all that much. Teferi could be somewhat annoying. But maybe I just take the Cornucopia, which is their form of mana fixing. And make it too more expensive. And then play Hardened Scales. This one is still going to cost 2 in addition to all the X. Thoughtseize can disrupt our curve a bit here. Takes Shalai. Kind of prefer keeping the two drops here anyway. And an Ooze is next. So won't be able to double two drop, but could play the Orn Reef Ooze and get it going. And then next turn we'll have a pretty explosive turn. Don't need to worry about removal since we know our opponent's hand. So if they don't play anything too scary next turn, we should have an awesome turn lined up. So no double blue for either Narset or Teferi. 
they can play Cornucopia and they don't have the green for Atraxa and our opponent concedes, our opponent knows what's incoming. Next turn we could play Wildwood Scourge x equals 1, enters with two plus 1 plus 1 counters thanks to Hardened Scales, then play Brawler, which will enter with three plus 1 plus 1 counters, triggering Scourge up to a 4-4 thanks to Scales once again. And then we get to attack with the Ooze, which will add even more counters to Scourge and Brawler. And then we can transform our Invasion of Gobakan to add more counters to Ooze and the Hydra. And that's pretty much game. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing the Tokens deck. And uh, yeah, we're going to need some Trample or some other Evasion to get past a bunch of Tokens. Because even if we go incredibly large, our opponent can just Chum Block forever. So this hand is quite good between Aspirant and Scourge but it's lacking that evasion that I probably need. So I might have to mulligan. Okay, we've got a flyer, so got to keep. And then we've got a pretty nice curve with Initiate, Beast Caller. Opponent also likely to have some impactful enchantments that Initiate can blow up. So their commander can double tokens at 6 mana. Now Rishkar is also excellent here. Could use one more top end card to start maybe doubling our plus one counters or some planeswalker would be nice. Elspeth Conquers Death could also be quite effective. So let's say we play Rishkar, counter on both Beast Caller and Initiates and Smash. That sounds appealing. Or I could put one counter on Rishkar himself so it can tap for mana. Yeah, that's also reasonable. And want to initiate an attack, and then we can still train. And then by casting another creature, Beast Scholar grows, we can keep training. A Mentor of the Meek for card draw. And there's an Ajani, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Although I'm thinking Valkyrie is still better here. Could also Conquer Death Mentor. But I'm not too concerned about it. If our opponent spends mana drawing, they're not impacting the board as much. So let's play Valkyrie tapping Rishkar. And then... Can put a counter on Beast Caller, perhaps. Smash and train. And then next turn a Jani to push us over the top. Team will have Vigilance, so I can even play something second main phase after attacking. Okay, Garden's nice, makes a token and gets to draw, but only two mana left. Sentinel's a bit late to the party. Their opponent's going to be chumping with their whole team pretty much. And an Invasion of Gobakan, also nice to have a look. I will decline, opponent gets to draw. But yeah, we were definitely the aggressor in this game. Doesn't matter if you've got a million cards in hand when you're dead. I will. Opponent's got to block one more creature here. Opponent's very reluctant. Falls to four. So we will actually be unable to cast Arwen or Invasion since we don't have the white mana for it. Just four green. Mentor attacks, so I guess there's a sweeper incoming after all. Mirari's Wake, never mind. Opponent just doubling their mana. And we can attack for the win. GG's. Alright, so we get to see our green-white R1 deck in action, and quite pleased with how it turned out. It's a plus one plus one counter synergy deck at its core, but it also has interesting lines of play with R1 making the team indestructible. We've got a few nice card draw engines to play longer games, so we're not limited to being a plus one counter aggro deck. We've got other angles of attack as well, which is always nice for your commander deck to keep it more varied and keep the games more interesting. So yeah, that'll do it for today's gameplay. Wanna thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel. And you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.